I think sometimes there's a gap between what the architect is producing and delivering on paper and what the client understands. Episode 127. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. My name is Ryan Willard and this week I am speaking to Michelle Lowe who is the founding director at Red Shell Consulting. Now Red Shell is a consultancy that offers project management, cost management, claims consultancy. Um, they are involved in the developmental roles and services to the construction industry and they serve many various sectors. They've worked with clients including private high-end residential developers and households, commercial investors, as well as high-end world-class hotel and hospitality providers. Michelle's background herself was originally in quantity surveillance and she set up Red Shell in 2014. And in this conversation, it's really interesting. Michelle discusses the importance of building very powerful teams, um, how to be able to keep everybody focused and on track on delivering the uh, outcomes of any project and of course the roles and relationships that involve architects in the processes of construction. So sit back, relax and enjoy this conversation with Michelle Lowe. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Michelle, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Thank you. Absolute pleasure to be here in Allgate speaking with you. So you are the co-founder or founder of um, Red Shell Consulting. Yeah, that's right. Founding director. Founding director. And you are a QS. A QS at heart. A QS at heart. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how Red Shell came about. Um, it's quite a, I suppose, a long story, actually. Um, so I joined construction industry at 17. So I dropped out of school. I dropped out of my A-levels at the time purely to work in construction industry. So I started being a QS really young at 17 for um, main contractors. Um, so that's why I'm a QS at heart, because that's where I started. So I spent the first 10 years being a main contractor's QS, mm. you know, front line, um, on the ground, on site, in the 90s, you know, teenage girl. It was quite challenging, as you could expect. Um, and then after that, I started to move into project management, consulting roles, employees agent, contract administrator, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the last couple of years, I've branched out on my own yeah. to then be Red Shell Consulting, where I work very much client-side. Great. So although QS at heart, I really incorporate the project management and skill set, things like that as well. And so when you say work, you work very much client side. What does, mm. what does that mean? What, is your, what would you say your role is now? How would you describe it is that you do with your clients? It's kind of been the same for a while, actually. I think kind of right hand man to the client. So whoever the client is in their construction project or their delivery, generally they need guidance in the construction world. They need to understand and they need to be you know, advised on how to deliver the project well for them. And I think that's really where I step up. So yeah. I'm always, you know, leading it on their behalf. So that could be a private individual in their own home, in their residence, and they don't understand or haven't, you know, delivered projects like that before. Or it could be a developer mm. um, who is doing many, but again, they've got their head maybe in the finance and the lease agreements and this side of things. And then I take on the construction for them and deliver it. So that's kind of where I think I sit. And you were, we were discussing earlier about the importance of being able to educate clients about the other consultants that they're working with. Yeah, very much so. Um, 
I've been in this industry a long time, so 25 yeah. years. So I'm super passionate about it, but I take it very damn seriously. So to me, construction is a profession. It's an industry. This is something to be respected. This is something we've all trained in. You as well. We've all been educated. We've got our degrees. We've got professional memberships. You know, we absolutely take it seriously what we do. On the other side of that, we get many people coming into the industry that want to build things and want to do this mm. and want to change that. They don't understand or appreciate this is an industry and we do things this way. So I find very much where I am perhaps working with more naive clients or someone that's coming into the industry from somewhere else um, that I have to, and I like to, <laughs> I don't know what that says about me, I like to, I like to educate them and say, right, okay, well, this is great, you know, this is your idea, this is your notion, this is your budget, this is how we do it and this is how we can get the industry to work smoothly and these are the type of things you need to understand and respect. Um, and to get it done. So I do think it's very much an advisory role. Mm. Not everyone who's trained in construction, not everyone's spent that much time in there, not everyone understands it. That's okay. Um, I'm quite sure I can't do a lot of things that the clients perhaps can but, but, do. Well, this is really interesting because, uh, you know, a lot of what I end up talking about in the business of architecture is the importance of architects trying to understand clients from a different perspective. So it's kind of like, almost like a refreshing breath of fresh air to, you know, to hear you being like, actually, I'm doing the same thing with clients to help, them, side, to help yeah. them understand. So, so what kind of clients do you, do you deal with that are getting involved in property for the first time? Because obviously it's quite interesting to uh, dissect the different types of clients and their different levels of experience. Very much so. Because there's going to be different ways to communicate with all of them. Yeah. And why? Why are, why are clients got these different levels of experience what are their kind of backgrounds so if you can give a bit of a yeah sure overview of that and the types of people that you work with it's exactly that actually because if you've got a developer company um who have been developing for 20 years mm. they know what they're doing and they have a very different objective and expectations from architects their product is likely to be very different as well it's likely to be warehouses office blocks it's you know multi-residential units so that's kind of a side over there when you get to some really individual projects or something that's really quite cool, you've generally got clients that are a little bit more unexperienced, that are a little bit more, they're not a business to be a developer. They've yeah. grown into it, they've fallen into it. Some of my uh, very interesting clients, I've had a client that used to be a guitar player in a rock band who's now a constructor, you know, a developer and wants to do high end resi. And I'm like, brilliant but you need to listen to me. <laughs> you really are going to have to pay attention here because yes. you know what your, your understanding is uh, it's not as easy as what you think it perhaps could be. Um, I've got other clients that have come from finance backgrounds. Now that seems an obvious kind of growth, doesn't it? Because you're like, well, if you can sort out funding, if you can sort out finance, if you know how all this works, you can manage a construction project. It's like, well, no, you know, the funding is a massive part of this. Without it, nothing stacks up in the first place. But you focus on that. Let me build it. <laughs> yeah. you know the, the construction side of it so you architects must find it absolutely the same and especially in and around London there is such a variety of types of clients out there and local authorities experienced developers you know schools residential healthcare all that kind of stuff and then the real kind of individual you know almost owner occupiers or people from overseas or you know all that kind of mix as well um, and it's you can't do one service for all yeah. You can't be one architect for all of those. You need to vary how you respond, what you say, how you deliver, and kind of how you educate, depending on what the client is, I think. Uh, yeah, and, and, it, and it's also the more understanding you have of your where your client is at with their experience of building, you can also cater a different kind of offer. Mm -hmm. And you can start... To, and, and this is a... I think you need to. Yeah. You absolutely need to. Because otherwise, if you're treating them as you would an experienced... Um, and you're doing the same feed level, they're not going to understand what's in and what's out of that. You're going to end up doing much more work than you expected to. You're then not going to be, you know, recompensed for that amount of time and effort, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And you're going to fall out <laughs> yeah. in summary. So you do absolutely need to attune what you're doing, what you're delivering, depending on what their needs are. It's what their needs are. And how, and how do you then get involved with working with other con professional arch you know, architects, engineers, other types of uh, construction consultants? How are you managing that dialogue between the client 
and the other parts of the of the project. I mediate a lot of time. I spend a lot of time mediating, and that's okay. I do think, especially if I'm lead consultant and I've taken a project on, I will mediate all day long. That's fine because I understand where my clients are, and yeah. I'm still protecting them. Of course, mm. I am because that's my job. But also, the consultants that I'm speaking to will understand where I'm at because I'm speaking their language. I'm like, no, no, we're the professionals here. We need to deliver this project. This is how we need to do it. And I find. Going off on a slight tangent, something I found really recently is the whole industry is changing. There's a whole lot more of our smaller independent consultants mm. than the big, you know, ACOMs and the big, you know, churning wheels. You're finding the same as well. So I'm collaborating a lot more with structural engineers, with architects, with building surveyors, with project managers. You know, everyone that is an intrinsic part of delivering a project, there's small independents out there and we all want to do our jobs well. We do want to do our jobs well. So we can now start to collaborate and then actually, you know, find the way of lifting the professionalism a little bit. But for what have you been finding makes for a successful project? And what have you been, what do you, from your perspective, are architects really good at and what are they not so good at? And what, where do you come in to kind of up the game a little bit? Yeah, okay. Um, I think the most important thing about a project is delivering for the good of the project. It's my mantra. Right, I've been okay. preaching it a lot recently. It's my mantra for the good of the project. Now, not everyone likes to hear that because everyone's got their own objectives. Everyone's got their own you know, personal motivations of whatever they want to achieve out of this project. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> let's do this together. For the good of the project is what we should all be doing. So that would sort a lot of the stuff out, actually. I think the architects are really, really good with their designs, with their um, innovation, with you know their creativity, and all of that is amazing, and get it on paper. I think sometimes there's a gap between what the architect is producing and delivering on paper and what the client understands. Right. Because they don't always necessarily understand a drawing or what is perceived or can think about it five steps down the line, what that actually means in reality. Yeah. And I think that's where there's a bit of a gap because the architects will say, well, I've done my bit. I've done stage four. Can't have my money, thanks. You know, we're out. And the client's <laughs> like, well, this is actually not what I wanted, but it's what, what you, what what you presented it? to me. I just didn't understand what it was. So there's just a little bit there. So that's maybe where there's a role for an extra level on top of just the designs. Yeah. You know, the kind of, the education, I suppose, is what yeah. we're back to. And then the, the kind of clarity in, in being able to communicate. And what does this mean? For, for you, when you say the good of the project, yeah. how do you quantify that? How, how do you, what are the sort of KPIs, if you like, or the, thing, or the things that you might quantify or are qualitative yeah. that define what the good of the it's project is? what the is. right thing to do is. Absolutely the right thing to do. Um, let's see if I can think of a good example. There is so much confusion in a project regardless of how well it's managed um, there is a lot of confusion there's a lot of things that can go wrong there's a lot of many many different parties as we well understand mm. um, and it causes so much frustration um, so when there's a decision to be made instead of it being the cheapest the quickest the thing that the client wants for free um, it should the decision should be based on what's actually the right thing for this project, for the building, for the product that we're delivering. Right. You know, maybe sometimes the client should pay a bit more. Maybe sometimes the supplier should give a better product for the same price. Maybe sometimes the architect should just do the drawing revision. You know, whatever. But if we can all take on board that same kind of notion, what's for the good of the project? We all deliver a little bit better. Right. We all deliver a little bit more. The end result is better. And if that's what we're working for, isn't it, is to build cool stuff and to build it well. So if we kind of start working towards that a little bit, we'll find that maybe we're not all battling each other all the time. That we're actually just, you know, coming together a bit more as like a... And, and, and is there like, do you have a, a, a clear process for creating that kind of unified vision of what everyone's working for? Shouldn't be preaching it at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying. I'm really trying. Um, just trying to, you know, instill the cool cooperation really early on in yeah. a project absolutely it's not everyone's like collaboration and all the buzzwords and stuff but it's just getting everyone to cooperate really mm. early on for that same goal and the only way I can do that really is by continuing to be the mediator continue to G everyone up continue to say right okay now what's what's our end result here let's let's focus on that let's do that let's do that and then everybody wins yes. if we get it right when we start falling out when it starts falling over and that's when everyone starts you know cross attacking each other we just let's not do that so, and and so and so, who, that make sense? yeah. <laughs> I, 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 you're kind of like 
you kind of have quite a, a strong leadership role in being able to pull a team together and develop a kind of culture for each individual project. So do you get hired directly by the client first or do you often have other consultants will be like, we need to work with Redshell to deliver a project. They kind of recognize that there needs to be... That I can help. Yeah, because yeah. often, you know, my experience of working in construction is that it, you, you do get consultants working in their own worlds and it can be they're very used to working in their own world and they're very good at working in their own world and yet there is a little oversight about particularly what the client is actually trying to do and a client can be in their own world as well and as you said there's so many different levels of the, the levels of uh, expertise and experience that a client can have yeah so so you, does a, who would know how to that there's like you're the missing piece, that's what I'm asking, I suppose. Yeah, like, it comes from all places, actually. It does. It's anyone that's um, experienced in delivering projects yeah. would know what was perhaps missing. You're quite right. I think, um, you know, technical consultants definitely work in isolation very much so, and it's mm. about putting that together. But that's, you know, that's just part of it, I think. Um, I've been brought on board into projects from architects, for sure. I've been brought on board into projects directly by clients, and that's generally what happens. I've actually been brought on board by mezzanine funds as part of funding arrangements. I say, you don't get your funding, Mr. Client, and then she can come and help you out with this because you're struggling. So that's a real kind of accolade, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's like, right, okay. It does mean that I generally get the really problem projects. <laughs> <laughs> because, because you know, that's just, I suppose, I like to have a little rant or a challenge, I don't know, but I, that generally does happen. Um, so it is, I do get pulled in from all different sides, um, but that's awesome, that's awesome. Um, and it's anyone that's experienced enough in, in delivering any kind of construction project mm. will understand the roles that are needed and where the strengths need to be. You know, if it's a very slick team, if it's a warehouse and the team's built 20 warehouses before, and everyone's, you know, up and running, you carry on. Absolutely, you're fine, you're working. Yeah. Um, but it's when things get clunky, it's when things aren't working, it's when risks are starting to incorporate. Um, that's when you need someone to put it all together. So for you, what is a particularly challenging project? What are the ones that you love working on? I do love working on the shiny ones. I'm just going to, yeah. before I <laughs> shoot myself in the foot massively, I do like projects that run really smoothly as well. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. I suppose, I don't know, it's not like I'm particularly drawn to them, um, but I do love it when, you know, we're all having to push in the same direction. It's a bit of um, camaraderie. Yeah. You know, no way to, you know, blow it all out of the water and say it's a war zone. But you know what I mean, don't you? When things are, like, getting tricky, and we're like, right, now, come on, we can actually pull this off. It's really push ourselves and challenge ourselves. And, of course, you know, lots of people like that, don't they? I do quite like that. And and, and is, is there a difference? You say you work on a, a variety of projects typologies so mm. from anything from infrastructure to commercial projects or I mean infrastructure is quite its own world yeah it is it's, actually and, I've priced infrastructure but I've right. never really built a road which is okay which is okay but there's like more civils type of QSs and project managers that, that deal with that um, in my 25 years I think I've built pretty much everything which you would do which you would do um, in various guises so I've done a lot of um, commercial, I've done a lot of residential, a lot of healthcare, all that kind of stuff, and that's fine. Yeah, I've been really, really fortunate in the last four or five years of working in London. I've had the opportunity to work on some really cool stuff, and you get a bit spoiled because then you're like, Wow, I don't want to go back to the Midlands and build warehouses now, do I? So I'm do this really <laughs> cool stuff in London. So, kind of the, the high end, the unusual, you know, the really nice projects in and around London, I've been really lucky enough to work on that and that's where I kind of like to stay <laughs> and, which is all right and 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 how how has your how would you describe the shift in role from being a QS because QS can be quite mm. a, a very detailed and almost not I mean I don't know no you're right from, 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 my, from, my, from my perspective like the, yeah. the QS role can be a very yeah uh a micro view of a particular part of the project or you're, you know, you're dealing with mm. quantifying stuff, so you're dealing with numbers and you're dealing with project costs, not always, and it's not always related to the whole overarching. Now your role is very much a holistic role yeah. where, where you've got a overarching view of all the different moving components and a very unique position as well because you're not acting as, as an architect or an engineer or kind of mediating between both. How did that role, how did you get versed in that or how the transition from QS 
Mm. How does QS help you in this role as well? Yeah, no, you're right, actually. It is a transition. It seemed like a natural progression Mm. from being quite young and understanding so much about you know, well, having to understand so much about subcontractor management and about, you know, the finances to a project, making that go around. And it's when I worked at Rock. Rock was the main contractor 20 years ago. They did go bust. They got really big yeah. and then imploded a little bit. Um, and I was working at Rock. And one of my bosses at the time, he said, you'd make a good project manager. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to be a project manager. Oh, my God. And um, Graham Cullerton. And, uh, and I still remember that. So I think... My project manager had gone off sick. I had to step up to a bit of a role, which was then become client-facing. Mm. I managed to cope with that, even though I was quite young and on, on site. So I think it was kind of a natural progression. And then a kind of, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 years ago, I then had a role as a project manager, but actually it was PM and QS. So it's just a natural evolution, I mm. think. You're right, QSs are traditionally... Um, very analytical, very down, and they're like numbers and can only look at one little part of a project, a little bit like accountants or librarians or something. And we, you mean, intrinsically boring is what we are, <laughs> intrinsically boring. So, um, so that is kind of how it's perceived. But I think as, you know, as the world evolves a little bit and as projects evolve a little bit, our skill sets evolve. So... And I've always got a lot to say, so maybe that was just a natural progression. Well, that, well, yeah. <laughs> and so that would be my next question. What, what are the sort of the new skills that you've... Well, what are the most important skills that you have that a project manager brings and is necessary for, for what you do with Red Shell? I think it's understanding everyone's point of view. Mm. It's literally as simple as that, isn't it? It's that I'm not, you know, butting with people because I know where they're coming from. Um, and it's it's about being able to manage everyone's expectations, but for the good of the project. Yes. So um, I think because I spent 10 years as a main contractor... It's made it very easy for me to be on the other side of the fence mm. and manage main contractors. And I know exactly what you're up to. I know exactly. And, um, you know, there are some some damning things that they do. It can be very difficult. But I also understand why they're doing it. But it means it's easier for me to recognise, manage, yes. and not be caught up in the nonsense, which does happen as well. Um, so there's the two sides of the coin, being able to be on both sides, I think, has really helped. And, and, and what sorts of things would you say that, typically clients have as an agenda that perhaps other consultants are not always sensitive to yeah okay for sure uh it's always this is going to sound a bit harsh but it's always down to money with the clients of course it is um because i didn't realize until the last couple of years how much weight the fund has in any project and ultimately if you don't get your project funded and i'm talking more of a commercial type Mm. development rather than you know somebody's personal house But if you can't get it funded, you know, it's just not happening. Um, So those constraints that the client is under has a huge impact on actually what can happen. Um, And I don't think we really appreciate that because we're the construction professionals and especially the architects, the engineers, we're coming at it from a creative perspective. We want to design great stuff. We want to build great stuff. You know, we want to have tangible fruits of our labor. We want something to be proud of. This is something we're working towards. But then the clients are like, well, that's all very well and great, but I need it to make 25% profit at the end for the GDB. And if it doesn't sell at the right time, then, you know, everything's going to fall apart. And we've got that juxtaposition yeah. where we're trying to create something and they're like, but I still need the balance sheet to stack up. And therefore it's a bit more tricky. And it's just having that overlap, I think. And, and how, what makes it successfully interlink? Because that is, that is the kind of mm. perennial conflict of architects and engineers and clients and that we don't want to necessarily think of our buildings as being financial instruments. Yeah. And the fact that they are being funded. And often this can be, I mean, I know from, from the architect side, when a project stopped... And it's kind of like this kind of mystery of like, well, what's happened? Yeah. Why is Why did that go away? We've just put in so much time and energy. And it's like really emotional and it's disheartening. (laughs) And then then you get used to it and you're like, well, that's just part of the the game. But what is it that we can do to help facilitate the things that are the clients are dealing with in terms of of funding or what makes that what makes that relationship successful? Mm. I think it's it's much more shared information. Clients are very Mm. um, they're very protective. Yes. their financial arrangement over there um, and sometimes they'll kind of misinform say I need it built for a million or something when actually they've got one and a half there's a misinformation going on what we need to do is be much more aligned really early on in the process and go right heads up 
What's the reality of this situation? Yeah. How much do you need it to cost? What have you got? This is, you know, how many units do you need it to be? That's, and I know that's all very basic, but it's not. Re- they're not giving us the real information. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really clear. And then if we start the design process with a QSM board, you know, other QSs are available, it's fine. Who's someone who's then really aligned with the designs as they develop, costing them at the time, sharing it in all of its reality to the client. Because sometimes the client's working on numbers that aren't based in reality, that they're very hopeful. They haven't considered abnormal build costs. They haven't considered their utilities. You know, something's going to be a massive surprise to them in six months' time. And they just got this, like, you know, kind of, oh, I can build for £200 a square foot. You bloody can't sometimes. <laughs> and, um, and it's about... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> we just need to get ourselves aligned. So if we can work at really inception stage, you know, architects, QSs, clients, yeah. and pull a project together properly early on that meets the criteria that they need it to do, and you're guided about what you can and can't do with your designs, I've got a grip on costs over here, you know, there's a fine chance of us being able to get it all the way down the line. Um, with you know as much input from all of us that we can allow. Well, that, that's really interesting that you say that some so many clients are very guarded or secretive about what's happening yeah, with the funding and the finance. Yeah. And from an architect's perspective or from a consultant's perspective, you know you're working towards you know they've set a budget that's going to be this, mm. and it's not. And sometimes they you know they say it's a million and actually it's a million and a half. And they mm. might do it that way around, and you know then there's extra funds, or it's the opposite. You're working towards. They're saying that they've got a million and a half and they've only got 750,000 or something like that. And that can cause so much, well, it can cause a lot of expense as well from the Wasted client. time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because Resource. Yes. Yes, hugely wasteful. Yeah. And it's very frustrating and it upsets everybody actually because again, we're only doing this because we want to do things well. So it's really, really frustrating. I am going to say something a bit damning. Uh, I think sometimes the funding isn't always in place yeah. or the funding is a loose offer and not a real tangible yeah. offer. And it's a chicken and egg situ- you know, situation. They can't get the funding or get it fixed in stone until we've done some work, until we've got some designs, until we've got planning, until we've got it stacking up. But because that may move and this is going on, at the point of us meeting, we're going to like this, yeah. like that. Oh, you understand, like yeah. my officials, <laughs> great for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> one hand was up, one the other hand was down. Do something with that. <laughs> so, but, um, but, but, but yeah. it makes sense because what you're, what you're saying is that the client is actually, they're managing risk. And when we look Trying at it, to, yeah, yeah. yeah, so they've got a risk because they don't actually, they need something tangible in terms of like, you know, a lot of developer clients, nothing becomes real until even planning permission is like yeah. one of the main things. And then once planning permission is in place, then that brings a lot more certainty to whatever investors are being involved to get a part of funding. Yeah. Now that can be on on one hand, that can be like a frustration frustration for the consultants, or it could be an opportunity because you're like, well, actually, we are now um, able to align our fees or our offer as part of, you know, that, you know, being able to... Uh, Plan and gain, or the hopeful. Mm. Exactly, like there's, mm. there's a risk. So you can, you can take on some of the risk as, the, as a consultant and mm. you can have a different reward as a result of it. Yeah, okay. By kind of, I mean, I've heard architects do that. Yeah. So, like, you know, they might, they might do something like postpone their planning fees till after planning permission is given and then they end up getting a final stake in the profits. Or yeah, okay. Like a, a total because it equity. becomes part of the fund drawdown Ex- as opposed to the developer having to fund Ex- it up front. Exactly, yes. exactly. And it's about being aligned then. Yes. It's, it's the client and the architect being very aware of the reality of the situation, finding a way to work together where it benefits both. Yes. Like that. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's still it, a risk though. Yes, yeah, it is. Exactly. Yeah. It's still a risk. And there's... Mm. And there's, there's you know, if you're going to take the risk, there's going to be a reward or there's like, you could lose. Yeah, you've lost all your time because you, you don't get planning, etc., etc. It's like, I don't know really what we can do about it, but there's so much that's dependent on the borrowing of the money. Mm. There's very few people in the world that can develop or build um, or whatever without having to borrow the money. Yes. But it's the borrowing of the money that causes the problem. <laughs> Because I'm kind of like image of some kind of utopia going on now where we can manage it a different way. But, you know, that is that causes so much of the confusion, doesn't it? And the uncertainty. So from your perspective, what what do you understand about 
the borrowing of the money, what is that kind of process that clients are often dealing with that impacts the, it's messy. the project? Yeah, messy at best, definitely. Um, I'm looking at my own small scale development. Um, which I've been trying to do something of my own for the last couple of years, of course. Yeah. And I'm like, I could build all day long. This would be fine. Right. So it's, it's not being fine. <laughs> it's, been yeah. very, it's been very challenging. Um, but it's the whole funding side. It's messy at best. It's unclear. It's the brokers are promising one thing, not being able to deliver. It's all a bit of a con. <laughs> it's all, you know, it's all a bit of a smooth talking. I can do this. I can do this. I can get you that. I can get you that. Reality, no, we're a bit short on this. Yeah. And then there's a, it's a mix, isn't it? Because there's a, you know, a senior fund, there's a mezzanine fund, there's some investors, there's, you know, about a seven line bar chart to stack how you're going to borrow all the money. And I'm like, this can't be how it works. Yeah. <laughs> this is, I'm a QS, I don't like this at all. <laughs> I'm comfortable with any of this. So it's just inherent, I suppose, in the funding world, but maybe much like the construction delivery has its inherent problems and we're trying to change them. You know, yes. Maybe there's some real shake-ups that we could do to the funding side to get this working better because it's, uh, it's catching out a lot of people, I think. Mm. And so you with, with, with VegShell, is that something you've done as well, more develop, developments or you've been involved on the equity side of, of projects? or? Uh, trying to do developments definitely so i set up red shell properties and red shell developments rather boldly yeah thinking i was gonna be able to pull all that off um red shell developments hasn't done anything i've tried yeah i've tried what, what have been what have been the what have been some of the obstacles that you found with that oh i found this is really weird the vendors the vendors have been the obstacles <laughs> so i've tried to buy a plot of land in milton Keynes. um the vendor pulled and sold it to someone down the pub even though, you know, we had an arrangement. I think my arrangement was obviously um, hinging on planning. Mm. He just wanted to sell it straight away. So that was the first one. I then had an offer accepted in a plot of land in Chesham. Three five-bed houses I was going to build. A big, bold move for my first development. Yeah, wow. All in. Got it through to legals. It had planning on it already. And then again, the vendor pulled and decided to build it out themselves. I was like, great. Th- thanks for that. Ooh. So, yeah, a little bit, little bit ouchy. So a couple of those sorts of things... So I, I don't know. I mean, they obviously went the right ones. I was very naive, you know, maybe racking myself up in that kind of level to start with might have been a bit too much. But yeah. I was going to have a go. So, um, so yeah, I suppose there's so many variables. I mean, I understand your place completely on the Chesham. I had an architect that drew me up some, you know, initial plans, et cetera, et cetera, on the fact the project was going forward. It didn't. It folded off no rope, you know, fault of my own. And then the architect's like, what's happened to this project? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm really sorry. Yeah. It's not going forward. Yeah. It's all of these conversations, isn't it? So, so yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we're still looking. If anyone's got anything exciting they'd like me to build or look at, that'd be awesome. And so, and so is this something that you're, you know, the kind of the future of growing, of growing Red Shell, consulting, doing more of your own independent developments and projects or you more want to focus on the project management aspects of things and this kind of mediation mm. between clients and, and uh, consultants. I don't mind. As long as I'm building, yeah. I'm happy. I do. I love it. I absolutely love it. As long as I'm building, as long as I'm out there, as long as I'm on site and things are happening, I'm happy, definitely. Um, of course, I want to build cool and exciting stuff. Because yeah. you would, wouldn't you? Something yeah. innovative and you know challenging and difficult and all of those things. Of course, I would. But there's no question that the day that I get on site and that I'm walking around it and I'm like, this is mine. This is my project. This is my building. I'm going to be so smug. Amazing. <laughs> be so happy with myself. That's okay, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so one day. So what's next? What's next for you in, the, in 2020? What have you got planned? Um, I don't know. I need to make some cunning plans, I think, early in the new year. I've got a couple of big projects starting, which are going to start... January, February time, which yep. will keep me quite busy, which is awesome. So very happy with that. And it'll keep me, you know, bopping in and around London. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll always keep an eye out on the side for something that maybe I can do myself. And, and the majority of your clients, are they London based or are they you're working out other parts of the country? Yeah, pretty much. I've got a project as far down as Worthing. It's on the south coast. Right. Uh, I've been over to Newmarket, but I'll go over there for the right client. Um, but generally, you know, the next ones that are coming up are in and around London. Um, so that's good. I think that's good. It's a nice place to be. I think, you know, the construction world is still very busy yes. in and around London, yeah. which is great. So, And if any architects or anyone listening to the show want to get in contact with you, what's the best way for them to do that? On all the usual social media platforms, of course. So uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. 
Um, we can maybe just put a note of what the hashtags yeah, <laughs> or, or ads are at the end of the podcast. Um, but yeah, certainly reach out. Definitely. It's always good to talk shop. Excellent. Great. Michelle, thank you so much for your time this morning. That's all right. Thank you very much for inviting me. Pleasure. Great. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.